Hi, I'm Rosie Acosta. I'm a meditation teacher, speaker, and author of You Are Radically Loved, a healing journey to self-love. Look, I grew up in East Los Angeles during the 92 LA riots, and it set me on a troubled path. I didn't grow up with mentors in my life, so I turned to reading as many books as I possibly could to learn about the purpose of life. In my journey, I found that having these conversations gave me life, and I decided I wanted to create a place where I could share these conversations with my community. So come have a sit with me as we learn about, well, everything. Oh, we're always in progress, aren't oh, we? Aren't we? That, that is the wisdom right there. <laughs> I'm making a call out to, I'm calling her Siri, whoever it is on Zoom that once we start recording, she says, recording in progress. It's interesting because sometimes she'll say that when I'm recording and sometimes she won't. So I get a little scared sometimes when out of the blue it happens. Especially after that last (laughs) week's episode of the scary stories. Right? You're like, oh. From cringing at the pump to getting an eye-popping check at your favorite restaurant, inflation is hitting us all where it hurts, and it really hurts. That's why I started using Upside. Upside is an incredible app for anyone who buys gas, groceries, or dines out. With every purchase, I'm earning cash back thanks to Upside. This app is so easy to use, and quite frankly, with the way the economy is right now, it's a no-brainer. To get started, download the free Upside app in the App Store or Google Play. You can use my promo code LOVED to get $5 off or more cash back on your first purchase of $10 or more. Next, claim an offer for whatever you're buying on Upside. Check in at the business, pay as usual with your credit card or debit card, and then you can get paid. In comparison to the credit card rewards or loyalty programs, you can earn three times more cash back with Upside. You can cash out at any time to your bank, PayPal, or e-gift card for Amazon or other brands. Upside users are earning more than a million dollars every week. That's probably why they have a 4.8 star rating on the App Store. So download the free Upside app and use the promo code LOVED to get $5 or more cash back on your first purchase of $10 or more. That's $5 off or more cash back on your first purchase of $10 or more by using the promo code LOVED. Hello, everybody. (laughs) Welcome back to Wisdom Wisdom Wednesday. Wednesday. Okay, we're back to singular. Uh, How has your week been? Let's discuss... It's been an interesting week. So I'm curious if you know what's going on with the stars and the moon and the sun and oh. the alignment. I mean, because I feel a little bit messed wacky. up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know if it's, uh, you know, I'm still kind of reintegrating from my week off and or or what is it? Do I, you have any insight into this? <laughs> I know that there is some crazy, my little bun head. I know that there's some crazy four planetary alignment happening this month. Uh, I know that we just came out of Mercury retrograde. Um, yes. Technically, and then Saturn technically retrograde today. is beginning. I honestly, I don't know. I mean, there's super moons galore. There's all this, all this stuff is happening, and I, I just. I feel very impacted as do you, as you do, I'm sure. Yeah. What does it feel like to you? Do you feel a certain kind of way? Yeah. I mean, I think for me, it feels very, and it could just be because I live in the city. It just, mm-hmm. it feels very frenetic, especially after being out of town a couple of times in places that are not as big and not as busy. Um. Mm-hmm. Being in the city, definitely, I I don't know if I'm just getting more sensitive. So Tori wanted to go see Top Gun Maverick. <laughs> He's like Ooh. obsessed. He's a major Top Gun fan. And uh, we hadn't been to a movie theater it, it, <laughs> like in a year and a half. I don't know how long. It's yeah. been a really long time. Yeah. And I said, yes, I'm like, let's do it. But he was making fun because as we were going, I was starting to get a little bit anxious because 
you know, movie theaters can be really loud. And I feel yeah. like, right, yeah. my sensitivity has become so intense. And so I brought earplugs. <laughs> oh, that's smart. <laughs> right? Well, you know what's... Yeah, it's tough, especially with an action movie like Top Gun, because oh, yeah. the action is so much louder than the dialogue. Yes. I wish there was a way to, you know, balance it's that low, out somehow. I know. And I'm like, <laughs> I know you're going to call me, you're going to call me a grandma, I'm like showing up with <sighs> earplugs and a blanket because I don't like to get, you know, movie theaters mm. are really cold. And then I had to have my snacks yeah. and I brought my booch. I had oh, this entire like setup and it was great. It's, it was actually really fun. But what I noticed is, I, I, because it's such an intense movie, I forget how we are so easily influenced and immersed into what we see on TV. Like they were going through all these really intense turns and upside down on these airplanes. And I was getting so nauseous and dizzy and like holding my breath because there was this really intense fight happening. And I just realized I'm like, wow, I left that feeling completely uh, sensory assaulted. <laughs> yeah. Well, you it know? kind of reminds me of we'd be in our uh, teacher training cocoon and just leaving that oh, for yeah. the evening or the, the weekend. It would be jarring to just go sit in a restaurant of all yes. things. Yes. You know, so we do become very sensitive to to things like that. And especially with the technology with movies. Yeah. And one like Top Gun, I keep saying that, but it's true. Like you you actually feel like you're flying through the atmosphere, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. I it, it was very I, I enjoyed it. I'm not saying I I didn't, but I I left feeling like why do we subject ourselves to this? Like, you know yeah. what I mean? I just, I had to come back and I laid on my mat. I was just, I had to do some binaural EMDR. Just, I had to get back into my energetic cocoon. And I just realized how, I mean, Tori and I listen to music. We we have just our like Sono system and there's music playing in our house all the time. And depending on the mood or what we're listening to, most of the time it's chill. Like it's either mm -hmm. Thievery Corporation, we're listening to Massive Attack or Portishead or Lhasa or something that is chill, you know, like just background ambient music. Um, mm -hmm. But it's really, it was really interesting for me to have that experience. And I, I almost feel like we've been so um, deprived of those really loud concerts and being around a lot of people and going to those busy restaurants because of COVID that I, I, almost like our bodies need to, uh, we're sensory, were you conditioned to be in sensory overlo overload that now we've sort of uh, self-regulated back into normalcy. And so we put ourselves back into that situation. It could be, unless you, you're a person that watches TV all the time mm -hmm. and you're maybe playing video games or, you know, that kind of lifestyle, I think it would be different. But I noticed that for me, I don't know, maybe it's the older I'm getting, I'm getting a little bit more, maybe it's like, you know, older people more mature people. They're like, oh, it's too loud. There like turn down that music. I find myself being that person. <laughs> yeah. I feel like I've always been like that. Perhaps it's because I'm such an old soul. Yeah. Same. Uh, <laughs> same Z's. Yeah. Same I've always been kind of a sensitive little one for yeah. sure. No, I love that. So can I hear the, the update? So I know you've been keeping track oh, yes. of, you, you're like my news source for what's going on in pop culture because yep. I'm terrible at keeping up with it. But I know that the trial has ended. The trial is over. Johnny Good. Depp versus Amber Heard is done. Okay. The jury favored Johnny Depp with the overwhelming, allegedly, the overwhelming evidence against uh, Amber Heard. And so Johnny Depp has come out as the winner of this trial and mm -hmm. you know it this 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 became such an interesting case study and I've been talking about it to you for the last seven weeks um a lot of it because yes I am I'm a Johnny Depp fan um but that doesn't mean that I'm an anti Amber Heard person I'm I'm definitely not uh you know somebody that likes to 
spew hate on other humans, especially not women. Uh, that's mm -hmm. not my thing at all. I just, I found it fascinating how we became so incredibly invested in this novella, you know, mm -hmm. and yeah, it's over. And the more time went on, the more people came after Amber Heard, the more she became this, you know, poster child of somebody that is labeled a liar, that is a psychopath, or that is, you know, all these things that were trending on, on Twitter. Mm -hmm. I found it to be extremely just heartbreaking, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Just the fact that people could, and I understand it's like, I, I watched the trial. I, I saw the evidence that everybody else saw. But to me, it's still, there's a lot of things we don't know. At the, I mean, mm -hmm. at the end of the day, we don't know. We weren't there. We heard sure. what was allowed, what we were allowed to hear. We don't know the inner workings. And, and honestly, it shouldn't even be any of our business th is the truth. Yeah. But to me, I think what was most heartbreaking was the fact that people have just this hate that we have for people, you know, that people can go onto social media and cancel somebody and just, yeah, laugh at the misfortune of somebody's life. You know, mm -hmm. I, I just, I, I had a really difficult time, uh, yeah, reconciling that just as a person, you know, I was, Tori and I would talk about this and I'm like, God, she's a, she's a mom, you know, like I just feel mm -hmm. bad. Yeah. And some people might think, oh, you know, well, she lied or she did this or she did that. And it's like, okay, I'm not saying it's okay to do any of this. I'm, all I'm saying is that she's a person mm -hmm. and I feel like you know, I saw this thing on Twitter. It's like, I hope everybody has a good morning except Amber Heard. I'm wishing everybody a wow. good morning except Amber Heard. And although that might be chuckle worthy and funny, and I get it, there's been people in my life that I'm like, I don't desire to wish a happy morning to, but I don't wish them to have a bad morning. I don't wish ill will on as I start to think of people in the political spectrum that I don't agree with and I don't like. Mm -hmm. um, see, but you got to practice loving kindness and compassion. And I am I really do try to practice what I preach and I have to really go into this. You know, Stephen Cutler and I had this great conversation in an upcoming episode where we're talking about his new novel, The Devil's Dictionary. It's very empathic, so heavy. Yeah. It's really great, uh, great novel. Those of you who are into like cyberpunk, sci-fi, mystery thrillers, it's definitely right up your alley. I, I loved it. I, I really enjoyed it. Um, and we had a really great conversation about it. But we're talking essentially about being empathetic and how if we were more empathetic beings, we would have much less conflict and we might have an easier time understanding each other. So yeah, I was I was a little bit uh heartbroken at the result of that mess, which again, culturally, societally, we keep showing ourselves. We keep mm -hmm. showing our ass, as Tori would say. It's like you're showing your ass to the world, like you're showing everybody who you truly are. And it's it's not nice, you know? And I don't know, I, I have maybe just a lot of empathy and compassion for people that are getting uh, burned at the stake, essentially. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I, yeah, as you were, I mean, like I said, I didn't really follow the trial, just the updates I got from you and Jorge, who's my other source of pop culture news. And um, to me and Jorge to be the, <laughs> you two keep me informed. She's mad. <laughs> Um, it does. That's that kept coming up for me too. Is this um, like Amber Heard becoming the butt of the jokes? All these memes making it a funny thing to see, 
yeah, but they're both suffering. But to really villainize her and to make it funny that, um, you know, and I say that in quotes because it didn't look like it was fun or funny at all um, to go through something like that. It's, it's dramatic for both parties, for everyone in, involved. So, I mean, and and like you, Rosie, I do my best to <laughs> to catch myself in the judgment and I actually have a good example of this. I was walking through my neighborhood the other day um, with my dog. I do this very um, similar route. And as I'm walking by this house that I frequently walk by, I'm noticing particular things about the house that call it out to me as a particular political orientation that I don't really align with. And I'm kind of subconsciously judging the person that owns the house for these politics. And... Yesterday, I walked by the house, and this owner, the homeowner, was outside mowing the lawn, and we made eye contact, and this person smiled at me first, and it was a very humanizing moment where I was like, oh, wow, I was othering and judging this person Mm -hmm. as being bad or wrong, and this person and I, were, were human beings, and we're here together, and we're in it together, and maybe we don't align politically and that's okay. Isn't that the point that like we, yeah. we get to live here in this freedom because we get to have different opinions. values and different opinions mm-hmm. about things and we can still be neighbors. So, yeah. Well, yeah. that that's what creates uh free thinking, right? Where we're able exactly. to observe and understand each other. And I'm not trying to convince you to think like me and you're not trying to mm-hmm. convince, convince me to think like you were able to hold both sides of the whole equally. And yeah. for me, I, I love to be able to do that. I love to be able to have that human connection. And we're, we've focused so much on separating and dividing and creating boxes and separating each other's everything, likes, labels, pronouns to become I, uh, to become, uh, individuals and to become, there's, there's one, one facet to that, which, and some people might disagree. That's okay. To be identified and to be recognized and to be acknowledged. Absolutely. I think everybody should be acknowledged as they are, as they want to be. But I also feel like the people out there who are creating so much of the division, is creating so much separation between me and you that it's going to be very difficult for us to have a commonality, you know, to have a common thread, to have a conversation about something that doesn't feel like, oh, you like this, then I'm not going to like that because you like this. And me liking that would mean that I follow your ideology, which I don't. And I don't want to be in that category with you where it's like, we can be so many things and yeah, I don't know. I mean, obviously I don't have the answers and nor do I care to uh, argue with people at all. I have like zero desire. I'm happy to have conversations about how we can be more empathetic and kinder and more compassionate human beings to each other. But I, I mean, I'm human too. Like I I don't like people coming after others. It's like seeing somebody get beat up on the street. Like what's Mm -hmm. the difference between somebody, a gang going after a person as they load their groceries into a car or going after them in droves on social media? To me, it's Mm -hmm. the same thing. It's inflicting Mm -hmm. the same type of psychological trauma. And I just, I just wouldn't, I wouldn't stand for it. I would, I would say something obviously like I would try and stop it, you know, but people think that because it's on social media under the guise of anonymity, sometimes people doing, creating accounts under fake names, or they can't even, you know, comment from their real profiles just to create more hate and divisiveness, I think is, is pretty um, out of integrity. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a sad it's a sad thing to to deal with and to come to come to terms with it has you know what I've been thinking a lot about is the purity of childhood and wh- when do we diverge from that state of 
you know, in childhood, we don't judge each other for things like that. We don't really see color. We have this innocence about our, ourselves and this sponge-like quality to just kind of soak it all up without feeling like, you know, I mean, unless somebody steals your toy or something, <laughs> but there's there's more willingness to explore the other in childhood. When do we diverge from that in, a, in adulthood or adolescence or whatever it is? Yeah. You know? No, I'm, I'm with you. I... I agree. Gaps in the diet shouldn't be ignored. Over 97% of women aged 19 to 50 are not getting enough vitamin D from their diet and 95% are not getting their recommended daily intake of key omega-3s. Rituals Essential for Women 18 Plus Multivitamin was formulated by exhaustive research to help fill nutrient gaps in the diets of women ages 18 plus. It is formulated with nutrients to help support brain health, bone health, blood health, and provide antioxidant support. But Ritual doesn't stop there. They invested in a gold standard university-led clinical trial to prove the impact of Essential for Women 18 plus multivitamin. The results, Essential for Women 18 Plus was shown to increase vitamin D levels by 43% and omega-3 DHA levels by 41% in 12 weeks. Ritual multivitamins have been a staple in my daily routine for a long time now. I really love supporting a company that is committed to third-party testing from USP and non-GMO project. They also just released Symbiotic, a gut health supplement with clinically studied prebiotics, probiotics, and postbiotic all-in-one minty capsule. Right now, Ritual is offering my listeners 10% off of your first three months. Visit ritual.com forward slash loved and turn healthy habits into ritual. That's 10% off of ritual.com forward slash loved. You can get 10% off of your first three months. Ritual.com forward slash loved. Is there a topic yeah. you wanted to bring up today? I'm curious. Yeah. Well, I'm kind of, I guess I'm leading into it with that. So, uh, on the way home, I mentioned I was in Mexico last time we spoke, and on the way home on the plane, I watched this great movie called Come On, Come On, yes. starring Joaquin Phoenix. And it's kind of a um, transformational coming in of age slash this really heartwarming yet heartbreaking story of two people that kind of come back into each other's lives and help help each other through a really tough situation. Um, and so, and it's a child who's, I think it's about in between seven and 11 and his uncle played by Joaquin Phoenix. And so I was thinking about, you know, our mentors in childhood, um, how they really shape us, how they don't have to be that, um, actual parental figure, but they can act like a parental figure. Um, and also what stories, really shape us from childhood. There's a lot of really great little stories um, woven out through the movie that Joaquin Phoenix will like read to his young nephew at story time. One of them that I had never heard before is called, it's an actual book, it's called Star Child. The author is Claire Nivola. Um, it's so good. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but there's just these few little sentences that I wanted to share. So, you will be plunged into Earth's river of time, his elders tell the star child. There will be so much for you to learn and so much for you to feel. Pleasure and fear, joy and disappointment, sadness and wonder. And as the scene is, Joaquin Phoenix and his nephew lying in bed at night, he's reading this bedtime story and tears are just kind of falling down Joaquin Phoenix's face. And the little boy is like, you're crying, aren't you? And Joaquin Phoenix is like, no, I'm not. He's like, yeah, you are. It gets you every time. <laughs> it's just this precious moment of connection um, where, you know, age is irrelevant. It, it, everything else becomes irrelevant. And all that's really there is the purity of emotion and the ability to connect in that moment. So I don't know if I necessarily have a question. Well, yeah, I do have a question for you, actually, and and everyone. And that question is, what stories or mentors from childhood influenced you the most? God, this is a really great question. I'd love some audience answers for for this yeah, because me too. 
I think it's, it's always so much fun to hear people's responses. Um, God, I had so, I feel like I had so many and, and in different, in different ways, you know, I, I think I was so influenced by people in my life who would tell me randomly that I could, I could do something more with my life, even though I didn't understand what that meant. Um, mm. Specifically, there's a story of this uh, actor that came to speak to my sixth grade class. Uh, his name's Tony Plana. And he was a big actor uh, in the 90s. Um, he was in a movie called Zoot Sue and a, a bunch of other uh, like films and a couple of TV shows. He was uh, from Cuba, so he immigra uh, immigrated from Cuba to the U.S. And he essentially built this life. He became an actor and very notable, respectable. And he was friends with my sixth grade teacher. And he came and he did this reading, like a monologue type of thing for our class, which was really cool. And he, yeah, he did this monologue and it was just, I thought it was really, uh, really inspiring. And so neat to have somebody standing there that I'd seen on TV, you know, as a little kid, it's, it's wild to see somebody that was on TV and to see him in real life. Because when you're a little kid, you don't understand that things get filmed on a set that they, it's not real, that it's like fake people are acting, you know, um, as you get older, a lot of the magic begins to fade. And mm -hmm. so, uh I, it, growing up in LA, a lot of that magic fades pretty quickly because <laughs> you, you just learn, you know, but it was really cool to see him come and, and give this monologue and he signed these autographs afterwards. And, uh, I gave him a, a piece of, of my, uh, do you remember Sanrio, Sanrio surprises? Like, no, hello what kitty. It? Oh yes, yes. Any of those like, yeah. yeah so kitty. I had like Caro, Caro, Caro P. It was the little turtle, I think. Uh, um, so cute little notepad and he signed, uh, he autographed a little paper in there that said, um, dream on mm. and, uh, you know, signed it. And I remember asking him like, well, what does that mean? And like dream on, he said, Oh, just the life that you see in your mind. He said, when you close your eyes, can you, what do you see? And then I'm like, black, <laughs> <laughs> very literal. I mean, yeah. And I was like, I see black. Is that the world? That's why the world is dark and <laughs> full of tragedy. Um, I was totally pessimistic at a young age. I was totally that kid that wore all black already at that age, like listening to grunge music. That was me. Um, and it was really, no, he, he said, when you imagine your life, like, what do you dream about? What do you think about? And I just said, uh, playing. <laughs> like going to the Griffith Park, Park Observatory, having lots of popsicles, paletas, you know, like this is just like my dream is ice cream and going to the Griffith Park Planetarium. <laughs> like that is my, <laughs> that is my, my uh, barometer of success. Yes. So the, the, <laughs> the stakes are very low here. And he said, well, whatever you see in your mind, you can create into reality. So you think about them as dreams. And if you think about them and you feel, I mean, he was telling me about manifesting, right? I mean, essentially it's what he was saying. And he said, if you think about them like they're happening now, then you make them come into reality. And if I could go back to a mentor or somebody that influenced me, I, I would say that that moment, that experience really helped pave the way to creating the life that I have because I knew that if I can see it, I could be it. If I could see it in my mind, I could experience it. And if anything, I could experience the joy of thinking about it in this moment. I don't have to wait for it to happen to feel happy about it. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I, lo I love that you had the wherewithal as, as that little kid to be like, well, what does dream on mean? Yeah. <laughs> how many times have you heard something that you didn't understand in adulthood where you didn't 
question it. You just didn't want to sound silly or stupid. Yeah. Or I mean, angry. you have to remember that I'm the child that got kicked out of catechism because I was asking too many questions. It goes I mean, to show you what type of person I was. I love it. I love it. Don't <laughs> lose like, that. <laughs> question authority. Um, what, what about yeah. you? <laughs> oh, so many. I had a lot of amazing teachers in um, elementary school. Oh, my God. Who was school? your favorite in elementary? What was your favorite grade? <sighs> I think back to fourth grade a lot. I had um, all of my teachers that really stand out in my mind were either English literature or creative writing teachers. And my favorite fourth grade teacher was Mr. Brown. Um, And I don't remember exactly what it was. There wasn't like, as I'm thinking about it now, a notable, you know, phrase or moment in time. But I do remember this felt sense of being in his class and being encouraged to be smart and speak up and um, to not, you know, like hold my tongue or uh, there was, there was just so much encouragement to, to speak, to be noticed. And um, I didn't get that in a lot of other classes. Like for example, in a math class, I don't, I feel, I felt so much fear. There was this felt sense of like, oh, you don't want to sound stupid. You don't want to sound dumb. Whereas in Mr. Brown's class, we were all really encouraged to, like you were saying, question authority and yeah. and have an opinion. Um, and it, he really encouraged that childlike sense of asking questions when you don't understand something, um, which I think serves us so much in adulthood, you know, to, to not be afraid to say, hey, I don't understand that. Can you explain that to me? Yeah. Yeah. I'm curious, like, even as you're saying right now, uh, oh, I don't want to sound dumb. Like even at a young age, like where did that come from? Like who right. embedded that into your psyche? Like what other shitty little kid said, oh, that's a stupid <laughs> question. Cause you know, it's true. You know, that's how yeah. it happened. Or an adult, maybe a shitty adult, <laughs> you know, like yeah. saying, oh, you know, that's a dumb question or you shouldn't ask. Like for you, do you, can you recall where, where that happened for you? Yeah, there's a few, um, boys my age that pop out in my head and I can't think of his name. I want is something Simpson Jamie Simpson. <laughs> oh, Jamie Simpson, you and, little bastard. It's funny because that grade, fourth grade, is when I remember him kind of taunting me. And then we got in, we went to high school together and we were like buddies. <laughs> So maybe it was one of those things where, you know, how they say a kid who's taunting you is is trying to fl- figure out how to flirt with you or maybe like has a crush on you. But yeah, I mean, even even still, he would say things to me that were um, felt not nice and made me feel small and, and felt like, oh, I should be quiet now. I shouldn't say that because I'm going to um, be judged or I'm judging myself now for speaking up. Yeah. Did you have... Did you learn that message? I mean, I did. I had people in my life, family members, like that would say, you know, don't, you're being dumb or you're stupid Mm -hmm. or whatever. Like, um, and I just would ignore it. (laughs) Good (laughs) for you. I would just, uh, you know, I, I think eventually as I, as I got older, Mm -hmm. obviously as a teenager, those insecurities, all that all those insecurities really ramp up. But, but as a child, um, yeah, I do remember like kids in school telling me that I was too loud or I talked too much. Can you imagine (laughs) that I just talked (laughs) too much? I was always like the teacher's pet. The teacher would always call on me to answer questions because I was I was always wanting to be involved in a conversation and Mm. yeah, I would, I would have, I can't remember, I can't remember what this kid's name was, but I remember him, I think it was like second grade or something like this where he said, oh, you should, you should talk less or you talk too much or something like you should learn how to not talk or something of that nature. And I remember that summer very vividly telling myself, I'm going to go back to third grade and I'm, I'm not going to talk, but I'm going to be like, there was this, uh, Hilda, her name was like a little friend of mine who I was also that kid that made friends with everybody. Mm -hmm. Like I didn't like people being left out. So I would see the kids that were 
loners or they they were by themselves. Hilda was very quiet, very re- reserved. And she just sat on a bench and didn't ever go play with anybody. She just was by herself. And I would always go talk to her. I'd always go sit on the bench with her for a little bit and just have try and chat with her. She was super nice. But I remember that being my model that summer saying, I'm going to be like Hilda. I'm just going to sit on the bench and be quiet and not talk to anybody. But it was so hard for me because I was just, I just wanted to talk to people and ask questions and obviously nothing's changed, but it's, it it is very much a part of me that got stifled during my teenage years when I was very rebellious Mm -hmm. because I felt like nothing I said was important. Yeah. Well, so do you feel like that is an, it sounds like you're saying this is an innate characteristic and it's not something, it's not necessarily behavior that was modeled to you by a mentor in your life. Well, I guess if I had to say there was an influence, it would probably have to be my father. You know, my Mm -hmm. father is very charismatic. He's very loud. He's very much the spotlight taker. He's very much about the attention. He, see, I'm not overtly like that. I'm Mm -hmm. definitely a little bit more mindful. My dad is just, uh, he's a, he's an artist. He's a performer. He is a singer. He's used to having the spotlight. He's part, he's used to getting the attention. And so I guess seeing him and my mom just both speak so freely and hold court Mm -hmm. with people, they were always sort of the, the life of the party, you Mm -hmm. know? So maybe I would say that that was, that was part of that influence, you know, having that. And, and my parents, thank goodness, never told me to not ask, not be, uh, opinionated, I guess. I mean, obviously when I was a teenager, it changes because when you're a teenager, yeah. all of these insecurities come in. But as a child, um, I, I don't remember ever being stifled, mm-hmm. you know, when, when speaking, you mm-hmm. know? Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. See, it's it is interesting when we it when we is. question who was there to shape me and influence me. It kind of it seems to keep coming back to our um, parental role models. Yes. You know? Oh God, they fuck us up so bad, don't they? <laughs> right. Oh. For better and for worse. <laughs> yes, for better or worse. It's like all my best attributes are from my parents and all my worst ones are from them as well. So yeah. it's like, what are you going to do? I mean, Tessa, amen. thank you so much for bringing that topic up. I enjoyed that. Oh, good. Me too. I love talking about this kind of stuff. Yeah, this is really good. So everybody, that's going to conclude our Wisdom Wednesday episode for today. Remember to subscribe, rate, and review wherever you get your podcasts. And also, we are still doing a book club, The Radically Loved Sessions. And if you are interested, it's totally free. It's just a book club. Right now we're uh, discussing my book, You Are Radically Loved, which if you haven't purchased it, we'll add the link in the show notes. You can buy it anywhere books are sold, Target, Walmart, Barnes & Noble, Books A Million, Powell's Books, Amazon. Uh, You can get the book anywhere. Uh, You can also listen to it. I narrate the entire thing. Uh, So be sure to support not only this podcast, but also our book sales. So thank you so much for being here. We love having you all. We love hearing from you and remember that you are radically loved. Thank you so much for listening to the Radically Loved podcast. Please remember to subscribe, rate, and review wherever you get your podcasts and follow us on Facebook at Radically Loved Rosie, on Instagram at Rosie Acosta and Twitter at Rosie Acosta. By the way, this is original music by DJ Taz Rashid. You can follow DJ Taz on Spotify and check out the best music for yoga and meditation. This has been a Mod Pod Studio production. Check them out at www.modpodstudio.com.